Well, if you guys know anything about me from now, if you have ever got to hear, hear me speak before, you know that I am not an athletic guy. All my sermons are not packed with cool illustrations of when I was a coach like Jeff or Brian. They're full of superheroes and comic book things because I'm a nerd. But there was one time in my life where I was going to try and get into the sports and the athletics thing. And it was back when I was about 10 years old in England, and I was kind of in that phase, you guys know that phase where everybody else is finding their thing, they're getting into a sport, uh, and in England it's usually always soccer, because that's the, the only sport we have. No one wants to do cricket. But we've got soccer, and I think, okay, I'm, I'm gonna get into this, I'm gonna find my way into soccer, that's gonna be my thing, so I try out. And whether there was just really bad tryouts that day or someone mistook me for athletics, somehow I ended up on the team. Now, we came to our first game, and we were going out on the field. I have no idea how to play the game of soccer. I know there's two goals in a ball, and that you should generally try and get it in one of the two. Uh, so I'm going out there just hoping I don't make a fool of myself. Uh, we get out, and the referee comes over, because at the start of the game, you've got to decide who's going to kick off first. And so he asks me to do a coin toss. And I'm thinking, what has a coin toss got to do with soccer? So he's asking me to call it heads or tails. And I'm like, I don't know, tails. So he flips it. And I'm like, oh, OK, we're figuring out where we're going. So then we set up, we kick off, and then begins a 45-minute half where I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. There's people saying, be aggressive, be aggressive. And I'm like, what's aggressive? Do I need to like dive on someone and kill them? Or like, do I just yell things? I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm running up and down this field like a headless chicken, like trying to work out. And if you don't already look awkward enough as a 10-year-old kid, doing it when you don't know what you're doing is even worse. So my whole social life is going down the drain as I run backwards and forwards. But isn't that kind of how sometimes we feel in church, that we find ourselves part of something that we really want to be a part of, we, we know it's important, we know that it, it can be life-giving and fun and joyful, but we don't really know what our role is? Because I wanted to play that game, I wanted to be a part of what was happening that day, but I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. See, I could have learned what to do. It's not, the problem wasn't that there's nothing in me that could be of use. The problem is I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what was in me that was useful to that particular game. Now, for the last couple of weeks here, this week and last week, we have come to this point in our Holy Spirit series where we are talking about what is called the spiritual gift. We're talking about these things that in the Bible, God tells us about that he has gifted to us in order that we might be of service to his church, to his family, to his kingdom. And last week, we came up with this definition for them. And this is what that definition is. It says, spiritual gifts are divine enablements given by the Holy Spirit to every believer for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. So as we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, we've been talking about everything that he does in our lives, everything that he provides us with, the ways that he transforms us, the way that he encourages us, the way that he points us to Jesus. And one of the things that he does, and in fact, one of the most important things that he does is he enables us to serve in God's kingdom. He gives us what we need to serve God's house, his people. And we want to study these as a church because in the beginning of the passage that we're looking at for these two weeks, Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed. At the start of that passage, he says, I don't want you to be confused about what this is. So if we are going to think about what the Holy Spirit does, if we're going to think about particularly what he's doing through us, then we don't want to be confused. Now, last week, we took kind of an aerial view of this whole topic. We went up a 1,000 miles in the sky and said, what are spiritual gifts generally? Who gives them and who gets them? And we said that God gives these gifts to every believer. So if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, then you have a spiritual gift. It's not something that's optional. It's not something that's a maybe. You have it by being a part of God's family. He gives these to every believer. And it's not based on prior qualifications. It's not the most talented people. It's not the unique people who are better at certain things than others. The whole idea of spiritual gifts is something that we can't do of our own ability and our own strength that the Holy Spirit enables us to do. 
So again, I want to remind us of that as we go back into this passage, because this is so important. Everyone in this room who calls himself a follower of Jesus, this topic is about you. This passage is about you. It's about what God is doing in your life, and more importantly, through your life in this church, in this community, in this city. So I want to pray again as we go back into this, because I want to ask the Holy Spirit to, again, give us a passion and an excitement about what we're talking about tonight. Because this isn't just something that we chat about because we're all Christians and we want to understand this thing called spiritual gifts. This is the very heartbeat of who we are and what we do. We serve God, we love people, and we do it through our spiritual gifts. So let me pray one more time for us as we go back into God's word. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's perfect, that it gives us everything we need. And God, I pray that tonight you would teach us about spiritual gifts. That as we read through Paul's words in Corinthians, you would remind us about what these gifts are, how we can know them, and how we can use them, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So if you want to read with me, we are in 1 Corinthians again, and this is chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. This is what Paul says. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is a cast, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So the first thing we're going to look at tonight as we bring this a little closer to home, as we take this big idea and personalize it to us, is what are the gifts specifically? What are the specific spiritual gifts that we see in God's Word? One of my favorite things to do with my wife and with friends is to go to trivia nights at restaurants. It's a really big thing in England. We call them pub quizzes. You get to go out to a restaurant with your family, and there's usually a round of different kinds. There's a music round, a movie round, all these different kinds of rounds, and it's really, really fun to go along. Now, the best way to do this, of course, is to make sure ahead of time you've got someone on your team for every conceivable round. You want to bring your movie guy, you want to bring your music guy, you want to bring your guy who knows about 80s music, you want to bring your guy who knows about 1920s farming techniques, because they will bring up the most bizarre things. But you want to make sure that you have someone on your team for everything that comes up. And there was one particular night that I went along to one of these nights with a friend, and some of the strangest things came up, but every time it did, we were the only team that had someone who knew about that topic. My wife's particular topic that she gets very excited about is well geography. Don't challenge her on anything she says about it. She will turn dark. It's, it's very scary. Uh, but she loves that. And, and sure enough, these questions about what is the capital of Digibooty came up, and she knew it. She knew all these things. Now, the reason that that is so satisfying when you are sat in these things and you're doing these quizzes and people are coming up with this is because you know that your team, your group, has everything it needs to be successful. You know that no matter what's going on around you, your team has everything it needs That is what the family of God is like. That's what the church is supposed to be. It is supposed to be the place where because of God's Holy Spirit, because of his amazing love for us, he gives us everything we need to do the task that he set before us. That's why this is so exciting for us because this is not something that is about the beginning of the church. This is not about something that happened way back when. This is for today. This is about what God is doing through the people sat in this room 
There is a perspective in Christianity called cessationism that believes that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have ceased. The basic view is that there was something that God gave the apostles at the beginning of the church to do their job, but not for us. It's something that passed away once the church was established. But we as a church, we don't believe that here at Chapel Street because we don't see anything in scripture that would suggest that these were just temporary gifts. We don't see anything that would suggest that this was for one particular time and not for all believers in every generation. This is the particular passage. Let's go back and look at it again in 1 Corinthians where Paul goes through a list of some of the spiritual gifts. This is verses four through 11 here, or seven through 11, I apologize. He says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another various kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. See, the Spirit of God doesn't just give us some general enablement to be able to serve. When we become Christians, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our hearts. He empowers us. He gives us God's uh, very words. But he also gives us specific gifts that enable us to be a unique member of God's family to do something specific. That's Paul's point in this passage. He's writing to this church in Corinth. And Corinth is a very interesting church. If you were to read this whole letter, there's so many interesting things going on. They're actually very much like a church today in America. Lots of questions, lots of different views, lots of different thoughts. But Paul comes to this issue and he really wants them to get it. He wants them to understand that God has sculpted each member of his body intentionally, purposefully to do something. And so he lists these specific gifts that he sees God bringing to his church through his people. Now there's a few things to clarify before we get into some of those individual gifts. Firstly, we need to understand that none of these gifts make anybody any more important to God than anyone else. It doesn't matter what gift is yours. All of these gifts in the eyes of the Holy Spirit are equal. In fact, Paul goes on to say for the next three chapters in Corinthians to again and again make the point, none of these are indispensable, none of these are secondary, none of these are more important than the others. All of these are needed for God's church to be able to do everything that God intends for it to do. So that's the first thing is none of these are more important than any of the others. The second thing that's really important is that these are not just simple talents. Spiritual gifts are not just things that people are really good at. These are things that God uses in our lives to uniquely draw other people towards himself, to show himself to them. So for example, if we were to take the spiritual gift of teaching and talk about teaching, when we say that someone has that gift, we're not simply saying they're a really good teacher. That might be the case, and that certainly can sometimes be a part of spiritual gifts, but the main idea is that when we say that, we're saying their teaching has a unique ability to kind of encourage faith in other people. That when they teach, it's not just that they're relaying information and they're a really good communicator, they are encouraging other people to see God better, to know God better. And that's the same thing that's true about all the gifts. Every single one of these that we'll look through, that we'll think about, what makes them a spiritual gift is that it is an ability that draws people to see Jesus, to think about God, to have more faith in him. The third thing that I wanted to say, and this is, this is also really important, is there is no list in scripture that is exhaustive or comprehensive. Actually, there is no list in the Bible that says these 12, 13, 14 things are the gifts of the Spirit and nothing else outside of them is a spiritual gift. There's actually four times that spiritual gifts come up in the New Testament, four passages. The main one is the one that we're talking about tonight in 1 Corinthians, but there is also passages in Ephesians, in 1 Peter, and in Romans, and all of those lists differ just a little bit. Sometimes the same things come up, sometimes the same things don't. 
Now, in three of the four passages that we have in the New Testament, three of the four were written by Paul. So it's the same guy saying the same things, but those lists differ. Do you know what that means? That if it's the same person writing about the same thing and he doesn't always write the same list, it means that this is not an exhaustive list. This is not the only final list of what spiritual gifts are. He is giving us a general idea of what these gifts look like. He's trying to give us a framework to understand as a church, God uses these kinds of things in our life. This is what he says in Ephesians 4, 4, 11 through 12. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So we see already, even in that passage, it's not quite the same. There's some things that are the same, some things that are not. Now, there are too many gifts to go through every single one specifically. So what I wanted to do tonight is to try and understand them more specifically without getting lost in the weeds, is I want to think about them in terms of three different clusters. There's these three clusters that we can think about that will help us think through each of these gifts. And those three clusters are called the prophet, the priest, and the king. Now, the reason why I think that these clusters are a really good way of thinking through them is that throughout the Bible, from the Old Testament all the way through the New, God is primarily related to his people and served his people in a way very similar to one of these three circles. He has sent prophets, he has sent priests, and he has sent kings. The working of the Holy Spirit through his people, the gifts that God gives, usually fit into one of those three cycles. Now, this is not some perfect holy thing. This is just a tool to think through these. So, for example, if we were to look at the prophet cluster, the prophetic cluster of gifts, in that bucket, we would find prophecy, evangelism, teaching, knowledge, and the gift of tongues. The reason why is that that prophetic cluster is really all gifts that correspond to abilities that relate God's word to his people. Having a prophetic gift is about relating God's word to his people in some way. So in the Old Testament, we had prophets who were far less kind of foretelling the future and far more telling people about what God's will and what God's word says about the culture, about the things that they were going through, about the things in their lives. So all these gifts are like that. It's about ways we can bring God's word to bear on life. For example, an evangelist, if you have got the spiritual gift of evangelism, what you are doing is that you have a unique ability to communicate the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is, to people who've never heard it before. You have a unique ability to do that. You have an ability to bring faith in people who don't have faith, to tell Jesus to people who've never heard about it. If you have the gift of teaching, you have a unique ability to help people understand who God is, what he's done, why that matters. Even the gift of tongues in the New Testament, the the first place that that comes up is in Acts, when the apostles are all gathered together and the Holy Spirit falls. And what that gift originally is, is them being miraculously able to communicate the gospel to people in their own languages. They'd never heard it before. And they didn't have the ability to speak all the different languages that were there, Greek or Aramaic or all these different languages. And so God, through his Holy Spirit, enabled them to do that. So that's the prophetic cluster. It's all about relating God to people, God's word to life. Now the second cluster is the priestly cluster. So if we bring that diagram back up one more time. The priestly cluster is all about gifts of saving other people, primarily bringing God's love to people. So in the Bible, priests most often were the people that would sacrifice for others, that they were the ones who would pray for others. And so in this cluster, you would see gifts like healing, helps, gifts of service, of mercy, of faith, and shepherding. All these gifts are about helping other people. If you have the gift of mercy, you are really good at empathizing with other people. You're really good at, in their time of need, in their time of discouragement, you can bring mercy to them. If you have the gift of service, you are uniquely able to find ways to serve other people in the ways that they need. If you have the gift of shepherding, you are really good at helping people navigate 
difficult situations in their life. So all these gifts are really about how to help people. Now the last cluster is the kingly cluster. And these gifts are really all about the very practical things. In this cluster you might find things like leadership and wisdom, administration, discernment, and apostleship. These are the gifts that God gives in order to help make things run really well. People with kingly kind of gifts, if they have the gift of wisdom, they are able to think through things in ways that other people might not necessarily do automatically. If they have the gift of leadership, they're able to organize people, they are able to help people work and do their particular gifts and their particular roles much, much better. These are all really unique gifts. Now, the, reason, the other reason why I think it's important to think about them in the three clusters is that all of the gifts of the Spirit, all of the spiritual gifts are supposed to come together to do one thing in specific. Every single one of them have one thing in common. Whether you are a shepherd, whether you are a prophet, whether you are an apostle, a leader, all of these are meant to show the world who God is. Because Jesus, Jesus was the perfect prophet, priest, and king. If we were to sum up all of his ministry, it would be that he was the perfect prophet, priest, and king. He told everyone about who God was. He explained the whole scope of God's great plan. He served people, he healed people, he loved people, he helped them navigate the pain and the difficulty in their lives. And he was the perfect king. He built the church, it comes from his teaching. He guided his people, he organizes God's people. So again, I want you to think of these three clusters as a way to start thinking about these gifts in specific. Maybe think about what cluster do you find yourself in most often? Do you think that you fit in the prophetic cluster a little bit more? You're really good at talking about the gospel, talking about who God is, helping people understand how the Bible relates to their life. Are you more in the priestly cluster? You like to serve people. You love to give your time and your talents and your skills to serve other people, to help them in some way. Or are you in the kingly cluster? Are you the kind of person that can organize others, organize ideas, help think through what's going on. These are all important gifts, but they don't tell us what ours are particular. We can look at this list and we can feel a little bit like I talked about at the start, where you, you don't know what your role is. You look at the list and you think, wow, those are really exciting gifts, but I just don't know what my gifts are. So that's the second question that we need to think about, is how do I know my gift? How do I know the spiritual gift that God has given me? Another embarrassing story about myself, when I was younger, I found myself being picked to learn French horn. Okay, so if my social life hadn't gone down the drain enough from the football incident, now they tell me I've got to learn French horn. Because we did this little test as a school where they check kids to see if you can uh, if you kind of, you've got musical talent, they'll play these different notes, and if you can pick them up, they think, okay, let's, you, you clearly have got some musical talent, let's teach you an instrument. So I found myself in this position of being told, you're gonna learn about French horn. Uh, and so I started doing it. Then the real pain came, they decided, actually, we think you'd be better on tuba. <laughs> now, you already know what a tuba looks like. Everybody knows what a tuba looks like. It's the ugliest instrument in the orchestra. It's as tall as I am, it's huge, and apologies to anyone who plays tuba, it makes beautiful noises, but let's be honest, it looks ugly. And so here I was being told, now I'm moving from French horn to tuba, and all I could think about is I don't want to do that. I do, that one over there, I don't want to have my face attached to that instrument. I'm perfectly happy learning how to do this one over here. Now, one of the reasons they'd asked me to do that is because in this particular orchestra, they needed some tuba players. They had a whole string of French horn players. They needed some tuba players. But in my mind, I was thinking, I don't want to do that. That's not something that excites me. That's not something that I think that I'm naturally able to do. But what I needed to realize in that moment is that being in an orchestra, being part of a team like that, and making beautiful music wasn't always about what I wanted or what I needed. It was about what others needed. 
What would make the music fa sound far better is if I put myself in a place where I would meet the needs of the orchestra and not of myself. That is also what the family of God is like. Spiritual gifts are not given to us for our benefit. They're given to us for the benefit of other people. Sometimes we fall into a trap of thinking through our spiritual gifts in terms of, well, what am I good at? What makes me feel good? What do I want to do? And those can all be important parts of using your spiritual gift. I'm not saying that you've just got to pick the worst imaginable thing for you and that's your spiritual gift. But what I'm saying is that's not a good place to start in thinking through what your gift might be. What Paul says, if we move to verse seven, is he says, each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So Paul decides to, before he even starts listing out what is there, he decides to tell us these gifts are for the common good. The spirit has given these gifts for everyone's betterment. So that's where we need to start too. Our gift is not ultimately about us. It's about Christ's body. If we start there, then we are in a much better place to start understanding what God might be doing through us and in us. And similar to our first question, I've, I think there's three clusters that can help us think through what our gift may be. There's affinity, ability, and affirmation. So affinity is really about what do you like, what excites you, what gets your heart going. That's what affinity is. And it's one of the ways that we can think about our gifting. I have a friend uh, who works here at this church, Laura Terrell, and she is very excited about teaching the Bible. She gets really excited about it. Now, when I'm around Laura Terrell and when she talks about God's word, I can tell that she is gifted at teaching. And it's not necessarily, she is a really good teacher, but that's not what makes me feel like she is a good teacher. It's not what encourages me. What encourages me is seeing how much she gets excited about it. Seeing how alive she becomes when she thinks and she talks about God's word. There's other people that I know that get incredibly excited about serving kids, about serving students. My mother-in-law in particular loves being with middle schoolers. She's very unique. But my question to you is, what excites you? What has God built into your DNA that gets your heart pumping? What do you have an affinity for? What is it in this world that gets you motivated, that gets you excited? It is possible that God is giving you a spiritual gift in that area. If you really care about something in particular, if there's something that gets your heart racing, think about what God might be doing in that area. Second category is ability. Now I said a couple of times that spiritual gifts are not simple talents. I'm, again, I'm not saying that it doesn't involve talent or that it can't involve talent because sometimes it can. So that second category to think about is ability. It's a tool to think through what God might be doing through you. What are you good at? What talents do you have? What abilities do you have that you don't see a lot of around you? Or what abilities do you have that you see might meet specific needs in your immediate area? Maybe in your neighborhood, maybe in your family, maybe in a church, maybe in your business. What is it that God has placed in you as an ability that has a unique way of drawing other people to see you, to see Jesus? through you. Spiritual gifts are not meant just for the church. I know some men and women of God who are so good at business that when they go out there, when they do business, when they lead in that place in society, people are encouraged in their faith. A man I know in particular, Rusty Bland, I love hearing stories about what his organization does and the way that he trains his employees and leads his employees. People have come to know Jesus in his business because of the way that he chooses to do business. I think that he has some kingly gifts in the midst of his business, in the way that he chooses to train and love his employees. The last thing to think about, and I think is probably the most overlooked circle, is affirmation. And what I mean by this is, what are people encouraging you in? What have people told you in your life is encouraging them about who God is? 
I say that it's overlooked because if we're honest, we live in a world that's not always very encouraging. And I will be the first to admit that even in the church, I don't make a conscious effort to encourage those around me in the things that they're blessing me with. I think that this is hugely important to tell people what you see in their lives that is drawing you to think better about Jesus, to know God's love better. See, if you're not involving community in your gifts, then you're putting yourself at a huge disadvantage in knowing and growing in your spiritual gift. If you don't involve other people, if you don't involve community, because spiritual gifts are by nature communal. They have been given for the body, and so in understanding them and growing in them, we need to involve the body. So what have people told you in your life is encouraging them? What have people said, man, when you pray for me, or when you share about this topic, or when you do these certain things, that really makes me think about God's love. That really encourages me in who God is and what God's doing. I would love if this church was known for being a church that encourages other people, that goes out of its way to find every single person in our midst and saying, we love you because of this thing that you do. We find those people who are on the fringes and we tell them, man, we are really grateful when you do this because there are people in our midst, there may even be people in this room tonight who don't know the value of their spiritual gift who don't know how much they mean to us, don't ever assume that people know what their gift is, don't assume that people know the value of their gift, go out of your way to encourage them in it, to tell them what God is doing through them in your life and through others' lives. There's one last question that we need to look at before we finish tonight, and that's how do we use our gifts? In chapter 14, if we move forward, this is what Paul says in chapter 14 is he's finishing this discussion about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians. He says, so with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. The easiest way I can encourage us as a church to use and know and grow in our spiritual gifts is to say, let's go. Because the best way to understand it is to start serving. It's to start loving and meeting needs in our midst. These gifts have been given to meet needs in our midst. That's what Paul says. He says, if you want to see manifestations of the Spirit, if you want to see spiritual gifts grow in your midst, strive to excel in building up the church. He didn't say go and think about this real hard about what makes you feel good. He says, go and strive to build up the church. Find needs in your midst. Find the places where people need support. Find places where people need encouragement and go and give whatever you have to that cause. And you will find that you very quickly have a good idea about what your spiritual gifts are, if only by process of elimination. Find a need and go meet it. Because if we go in faith, then the Spirit will move. If we go in the knowledge and the hope that the Spirit of God wants to do something through us, then He will. Every great character in the Bible, every single person who has done something amazing for God started by deciding that they were going to go meet a need somehow. If we look at people like Elisha, or we look at people like Isaiah, or even Mary, the mother of Jesus, all of those people started their journeys by saying, I want to be used by you, God, in any way that you have for me. They didn't say, don't ask me to do the coffee ministry, man. Don't, I don't want to do that. They didn't say, don't ask me to tell someone about Jesus, because I'm not comfortable with that part. The people who get used by God most often are the people who say, God, here I am, send me, whatever it is. I know that you are able to enable me to do it. That's what spiritual gifts are, divine enablements given by the Spirit to do the work of God, to build up the church. So spiritual gifts always start with us saying, here we are, send us, make us able. My story, in fact, is the culmination of someone saying that Someone deciding that the use of their spiritual gift 
meant going and doing anything they could. I wasn't, I didn't grow up in a family where I naturally became a Christian. My mom was a Christian, but I, I didn't want anything to do with it. I wasn't interested in it. But here over in the States, there was a man who decided that he wanted to do anything he could for God, whatever it was. At the time, he was only in college. He was a freshman or sophomore, so he wasn't very old. And he thought, I know some people in the UK who need help with youth work. So he decided to go over to the UK to help with youth work. He didn't have any prior experience in it. It wasn't like he was a gifted teacher of kids. He just knew there was an organization in England that needed help reaching out to kids. So he went and he worked with some of the most difficult and roughest kids in all of England. Still hasn't met me yet. Then he meets my sister. My sister is in need of someone to uh, help her with some things at church, and my brother-in-law as well, and so he connects with them, and he starts saying, okay, well, whatever you've got to do, I'll help you with that. So he ends up coming on board and teaching a little bit in their small group. He helps them come up with Bible studies, something he'd never done before. Then he meets me, and my sister says to him, I have this younger brother. He doesn't know anything about Jesus. He doesn't really care can you tell him about Jesus? So I sit down with this guy and he starts having conversations with me. And again, this is not some preacher from some huge church who knows perfectly how to communicate the gospel, who knows brilliantly how to teach the Bible. This is just someone saying, God, here I am, send me, use me. And 15 years later, here I am in ministry excited about Jesus, because one man decided he was gonna do whatever it was that God asked him to do, and God, through his Holy Spirit, made him able to do those things. Some things that he was already really good at, some things that he had never even dreamt he would do. To this day, that man, I love him because he's still saying yes to what God asked him to do. He has done some amazing things. He went on a whole trip around the well to create curriculum for kids who were unable to go to school. All because he said yes. You see, spiritual gifts are not born out of our strength. They're born out of our weakness and our willingness to trust Jesus to do amazing things through us. Wasn't that Scott's story? Isn't that what that's all about? That he said, I, I wanted to serve. I wanted to do something. I'd never done a concert before. But here he was finding himself doing a concert that has now twice raised over $25,000. Church, when we trust God to do amazing things through us, he will do amazing things through us. Can you imagine the difference that would be made in this tri-city area if everyone just in this room, in this service, decided we are going to trust God to make us able to do amazing things? Can you imagine the difference it would make? Can you imagine the lives that would be changed? The stories that might come 15 years from today of someone else saying, because someone from Chapel Street Church decided to come and help me move. I know Jesus today. My life is different. That's the vision that I want you to catch when we talk about spiritual gifts. That's the vision that Paul wants you to catch when he talks about this in Corinthians, is that if everyone takes a hold of what God has given you and what God is able to do through you, it can change the world. It can make a difference in the lives of everyone around you. Maybe a good way to close is to just think about what Peter says when he talks about spiritual gifts. In his first letter, this is what he says in verses 10 and 11 of chapter four. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever, amen. God wants to do amazing things in and through this church, in and through our neighborhoods, in and through our families. And he wants to do it through you. No one in this room is indispensable and no one in this room is without gifts. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for spiritual gifts. Thank you that you enable us 
to do far more than we could ever do of our own strength. As we think through the test that we took this last week, as we think through what our gifts are, God, would you give us grace to know them, to have courage and faith to use them, and Lord, would you glorify yourself through this church that the whole world would see the good news of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.